Hello and welcome to the AV Forums podcast for Monday the 14th of May. And joining me on this edition, they decided to turn up, Steve Withers. Breakfast is most important meal of day. And Mark Buttrick. Maximum effort. Uh, and that's it. There's nobody else. <laughs> um, we, Thank we've you. Been ab- <laughs> Goodbye. <Yeah. laughs> we've been abandoned this week. Um, reasons for that, I think Mark Hodge just couldn't be bothered. And Ed's in Germany with uh, yeah, the Munich, show, Munich which High End Show, which is fair yes. enough. He's, he's he's working. So and Kaz is watching um, a new film on Netflix, I think. Isn't he? I, I think he watched that at midnight, Steve, because I had the review at 2 a.m. He skyped me at 2 a.m. saying, if you're still around, can you publish this? <laughs> I was longer. So, I was, as, I, is that Anon? Anon, yeah. Uh, I published yeah, but how was the review? Because I might watch it this evening. If it's uh, it, he said it's a 6 out of 10. Yeah. Um, it suffers Sounds for its nickel, isn't it? It usually makes some interesting films. Yeah. it suffers for its budget. Basically, is it's, oh, right. it's a bit high concept for the budget. Reading between the lines, um, so yeah. Um, Did you finish I, watching Lost in Space? I have. I finished the series. I thought it was excellent. Actually, it I was, really yeah. enjoyed it. Yeah, and and I'm happy with the ending because the ending now makes sense. If yes, they basically yeah, I, I see what they were doing. Um, yeah, it's good. Yeah. I'm, uh, I really enjoyed that. I thought it was a great show. I thought there was some really good science in it too. They did some. They tried to be reasonably scientifically accurate to a certain degree. And uh, yeah, um, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah, I was happy with it. And and the wooden acting that started, it, it got better as the series went on. And I got to like the kids because I thought it could be a bit. Yeah, too I much. like the characters, which yeah. is key. Yeah, uh, um, and I like the dynamic. There's a different dynamic to the family and so on. So yeah, there was also a scene funny. where, and it's not very often I actually laugh out loud, but the bit when they escape from the. Um, you know, the, the transport vehicles with the helium. <laughs> and she goes, I love you. <laughs> the really squeaky voice. Oh, was so funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So no more spoilers, but yeah. And I've actually started watching it again um, in Dolby Vision. It looks great, Dolby Vision. It, it does. It looks absolutely it looks really spectacular. Good. Really, really good. Um, and that was both on the Apple TV and in the inbuilt player. So unfortunately... The C8 still has the raised blacks with the Dolby Vision external from the Apple TV, um, but I could only notice it in mute. I've, I haven't noticed it in anything else, so it could just be that content. Yeah, they'll, they'll fix it. It's just TV problems. I mean, yeah. you know, this is all very sophisticated, and obviously they're slightly at the, at the mercy of a, a third party some of the time. Aren't they? Yeah, they are indeed. So, um, so yeah, so Ed, and like we say, Ed's in Munich. Um, so we'll have a full report from Ed. It'll be on the website before we discuss it in the podcast. But we'll discuss it next week. And he he also turned up at Donington Park on Saturday uh, while I was there with uh, the the Mustang kids. Uh, we had two hundred and forty seven Mustangs in one place. We set the British record. Um, for well, the that, most in one place, the most gathered in one place at the gathering. That mean you're in the Guinness Book of Records. Uh, yes, it's a UK record, not a, not a, obviously not a world record because there's a lot more of them in the states than there is here. But uh, for the UK, it was a, it was the largest gathering in one place of the Mustangs. So. That'll be your second entry in the um, Guinness Book of World Records, then, because oh. we were also participants in a world record largest 3D cinema screening. We were indeed well in remembered in Paris. Yeah, mm-hmm. well remembered. Back when that was a big deal. <laughs> Well, I think I've I've still got my certificate. Yeah, I've got a certificate that yeah, LG gave me. <laughs> you got uh, actual certificates. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. we got. Was that 2011? Was it that far back? I think it might be. Uh, yeah, I think it was actually. Um, yeah, 2011 with George Mead. Did you meet Norris McWhorter? <laughs> no, but I tell you, who we did meet Sophie Marceau, and she's fit. Yes, so that's good. we did. She was beautiful. Mm, gorgeous. Uh, Plus, a lot of other people I think were famous, but because they were all French ups, so you know. I who they were. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was a big oh, red. Hello. What there was a red carpet, do? wasn't there? There was a red yeah. carpet. Yeah, so it was, it was red a carpet. big red carpet event. Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah, it was, it was a big deal. Uh, three, and that was when 3D was a big deal. It's yes, not... what I mean, 3D was a big deal that year. The following year, we had the launch of OLED, but it took another two years to actually see one. <laughs> but, that's uh, right. Yeah, that's right. That was in Monaco, wasn't it? At yeah, the Grand Prix. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. We don't get anything like that nowadays. We don't get invited uh, to gigs like that now. I wonder why. That was a trip down to Weybridge for the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've always got Mercedes World at Weybridge, so and and you've got the Brooklyn's Motor Museum, so yeah, we've been, we've done both of those. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Previous visits. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, interesting weekend. Like I say, uh, Ed turned up with Will. Uh, I think Will was was in his element. I let him sit in the car. I made the mistake of letting him sit you in let the him car. Sit in your car. <laughs> wow. Because when I got back in the car and switched it on, the window wipers were going, the indicators were all going, <laughs> every button had been pressed. Go on, admit it, that was Ed, wasn't it? <laughs> he let Ed in the car. <laughs> so, yeah, 
so yeah, it was good fun. So uh, what did you get up to on the bank holiday weekend, Steve? Uh, I I was um, I did a lot of actually because it was unusually really nice. Saturday, Sunday, Monday were gorgeous. Saturday I was watching the rugby Bath, last game of the home game of the season, last game of the season actually, uh, which was really good fun and the weather was stunning. Uh, and then um, Sunday I, I was uh, I was actually doing a bit of work on Sunday, and then Monday uh, I set up my new reference AB system which is the Arcam AVR 850 plus the P429 uh, four channel power amp so it's 11 so, so it's four 11 channels yeah, so, direct... so it's a beautiful sunny oh, day spent... <laughs> and you spent yes, it yeah, yes. <laughs> I'm not kidding on the Monday <laughs> when it was a gorgeous sunny day I was in the black room <laughs> I th- I th- yeah, we've all got problems here. I think we really need to be seeing therapists. I really do. Like, I, I, look, I waited two days before I did it. I was difficult to wait longer than that. Because <laughs> <laughs> they arrived on the Friday, and I'm yeah. like, uh, I should really, you know, I've got this thing booked on a Saturday and a Sunday. Laura said, no, nah, come on, you can't go in a dark room. You've got to make it. I said, like, okay, sorry. By Monday, I'm like, no, I've got to do it. I've got to do it now. <laughs> <laughs> on, the plus, on the plus side, those are the days where you find out whether your blackout curtains actually work. I actually had to take it all down and start again because it was light coming through. So uh, it was a big job. I was, it was like <laughs> dismantled half the home cinema, cleaned oh. it all, rewired everything. It was, uh, yeah. I gave and, and you said you were working on the Saturday. Well, it's not like you to work on a weekend, so you must be up to your naffs and work if you're working a weekend. Yeah, I um, think some work. So, well, I was testing. Obviously, I had to. <laughs> some of it, I did do some writing in the garden, so that was okay. But also had to um, test the C8. So, so again, yeah. back in another dark room. <laughs> It's probably our job, isn't it, yeah. really? A lot of involves in dark rooms. Yeah, and, w- and what do we do to react? Uh, we go to the cinema or we sit and watch TV. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or sit and watch films in the cinema room. Yeah, it's uh, yeah odd. Uh, Mark, you must have done something decent. Uh, largely just kind of general bank holiday bits and bobs, you know, kind of bit of gardening, bit of tinkering with bicycles, that no, kind of thing. I, I, thought no. you were gonna, I thought you were going to say you got drunk and did some fighting. That's the normal bank holiday thing, isn't it? <laughs> no, no, not quite me. Uh, no, just standard fare, really. And how's your um, OLED doing? Is it all right? Yeah, no, I, I, I can't really complain about it. It's, uh, yeah, absolutely fantastic. Best TV I've had. Um, and obviously you're a yeah. he- heavy gamer, so any permanent screen burn? No, absolutely nothing. That was the the one thing that was really worrying me, the one thing that kind of kept me... I, you know, I kept going back to wondering about some of the Sony full array LCD sets and just thinking, you know, that way then I won't have to worry about um, any kind of image retention, anything like that. But I've had absolutely nothing. And I've been playing games which have got, you know, very much high contrast HUDs on them. And uh, you've been playing yeah, the I've had ab- games? Yes, I've been okay. playing um, uh, Horizon. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's got various, you know, kind of, very much uh, uh, kind of strong, you know, specular highlights and things like that. And, um, yeah, I've had absolutely no issues there, even even to the point now where I've got to that nice level of relaxation of I can actually pause something on the TV and just go and walk away, you know, if I'm going to do a job for 10 <laughs> minutes. Whereas the f- for the first, like, two months, it was a case of, no, put PS4 into sleep or, no, turn off the TV and then go, just in case you come back and you've... And there was something I was doing, and then you come back after six hours, and you know you find something burnt into the screen. So no, I'm completely relaxed about it. I'm I'm really impressed that I haven't noticed anything like that. That's that's good. That's good because it, it's something we're we're definitely going to be looking at this year because there's there's so much on the internet about burning and, and image retention. Yet you know we've been testing TVs for a number of years and we haven't seen any real issues. No, um, I mean I've seen the odd bit of image retention with a high contrast test pattern yeah, that goes yeah. away after a few minutes. I've never seen any. Thankfully, I haven't seen any screen burn. Well, not since the days of the early days of OLED when they'd have TV set up for demos and that, when they'd be that, showing the same is, thing for days and that days. That is and the days. only time I have seen permanent burning, and they were LG screens on an LG stand at an LG trade show, and they were running in the highest brightness mode, and they were showing the same thing over and yeah. over and over and yeah, over and days, over days, for days, days on end. And, and obviously, those were the early days as well, before they had all the yeah, pixel yeah. orbiter shifting features and the wash screen washing at night and all these kind of things. So. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you, you can never say never. There's always a potential danger. Um, but in my experience to yeah. date, and I've, you know, I've had the B7 for a year now, nearly, and uh, never had a single problem. So. Yeah. No, I, I think one of, the, one of the things that kind of uh, made me worried was the fact that it seemed like people were too quick during the kind of end days of plasma to say that image retention had been completely cured. And then, you know, with my final plasma set, I found that just simply wasn't true. 
and so therefore when, when people say the same things about oled again uh, you tend to doubt it um but yeah with the, with the b7 I, I just haven't noticed it at all yeah yeah and and i think it's you know it's it's online it's on the internet it's how forums work uh whether it's ev forums or other places where something gets sun, said as, as there's a potential for it and it's a bit like Chinese whispers and by the time you get to post four it's definite that every OLED is going to have burning mm-hmm. issues and image tension and it's getting silly now so I think that there needs to be some rebalancing and it, you know that's why I was asking about your experiences Mark because um, I think it's it, it's important to try and you know get some sensible information out there about how uh, susceptible these screens actually are to burning and image retention and so on and of course we're going to be doing our long term testing this year as well so that's definitely something that we are going to be looking at because I think these myths need to be busted and good information needs to be out there I think that's I'd that's like to see silly. something yeah I'd like to see something also addressed over the, the kind of claims of how much brightness an OLED might lose yeah you know that kind of thing because I, uh, you know, people say, "Well, it will get you know image retention." I haven't seen any. Or it'll lose brightness, and I'm thinking, yeah, you know, I'm not going to have this set for the amount of time that like my parents had a CRT set for. You know that this will be gone long before that, and long before yeah. it loses a huge amount of you know until I'm I'm kind of saying, right, shut the curtains. I can't see anything. Yeah, I think you'd have to have the TV on for twenty four hours a day. And running for about it for five years, for about five years before you would see any kind of difference like that. Um, and you're talking big figures. It's the same as like the laser projectors and that kind of thing. I mean, twenty thousand hours, and, and a lot of people think that that's not that's not very much. Well, that's a film a day for yeah ten years, isn't it? I'll tell you what, I've had the B7 for nearly a year now. I'll test its peak brightness and see if it's changed. Yep, that's a good idea. Yeah. Right yeah. Uh, before we talk even more TV, because hardware news is TV <laughs> that's dominated. All we've got. <laughs> We did say to you in, uh, in previous podcasts, you know, it'll be like buses. They'll just all turn up at once, and they have. And there's still more to turn up. So, um, yes, it's definitely TV se- season. So we're coming on to that in a second. But Mark's going to tell us about current competitions, and we even have some competition winners. Yep, uh, you can win Existence and the Grifters on Blu-ray, and that competition closes on 21st of May. Uh, also closing on 21st of May, you can win Insidious, The Last Key, on Blu-ray. We've also got an Arcam AVR 390 AV receiver, and that one closes on the 30th of May. And also closing on the 30th of May, you can win an REL Acoustics T51 subwoofer. And all competitions, as ever, are open to eligible AV Forums members resident in the UK. And that's REL for people in the hi-fi world. <laughs> is, is it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Went complete, completely over my head, that. Yeah, you know, it's, it's sorry. Like, I tune out when Ed's speaking. Yeah, REL okay, is REL right. and yeah. NAD is NAD. Yeah. But sometimes and, they and, do say NAD. I yeah. don't be confusing that one. Yeah. And, and <laughs> but R- it's definitely REL. <laughs> and REM are, are a group music group. <laughs> and REO speed R-E-L-P. Wagon are also a group. Too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, competition winners. Yep, uh, Lord Essex won a Yamaha YAS three hundred six. Have I said that right? Uh, music car <laughs> soundbar. Crocodile won a Yamaha. WX010 music cast speaker. Obey One won a Yamaha WXAD10 music cast streamer. And Blue Petros won Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle on Blu ray. And congratulations to all of them for having good usernames. Yeah, and for winning. Well done. Mm. Yeah, don't care about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. F- they're pronounceable. <laughs> uh, there we go. That's the first use of the beat machine in a while. Right. Uh, hardware news is next. Right, so like I said, uh, hardware news is going to be very much TV heavy. We're going to start with something that turned out to be pretty controversial, and I think it was because people just didn't read what you said in the conclusion, Steve. Um, Samsung Q9FN QLED TV is the best LED LCD TV we've seen for a long time. If not ever, I'd say. Um, Yes, uh, obviously Samsung had a difficult year last year. I think we can all agree on that. They launched their QLED range... um, and were slightly disingenuous in terms of some of their marketing, but also they were using edge LED backlighting. And when it comes to HDR, particularly on a flagship high-end model, it just doesn't cut it. So this year, we got the, rather confusingly, it's still the Q, Q9, but this is the QF F for flat, and then N denotes that it's the 2018 model, Q9 FM. Uh, and this is uses the direct LED backlight. So you've got an improvement there immediately because you've got a lot more control, uh, around about 500 dimming zones, 
Um, and obviously, also, it's got a really, really effective uh, local dimming system. Can be a little aggressive at times. I mean, sometimes, you know, depending on what setting you use, uh, you could find a little bit of crush just above black. But to be honest, it delivers black levels that I never thought I'd see out of an LCD television. And it, it was really, I mean, even when you had like, you know, a, a single bright object against a black background, you know, there was virtually no haloing. And particularly in SDR, and then a little bit with HDR, obviously where it was a lot brighter, but even then, it was still impressively um, minimal. Uh, obviously, VA panel, so that's good in the sense of native blacks, but it does mean you have to be sat pretty much central to get the best experience. If you start moving off axis, then you will begin to see more haloing and a loss of contrast in color performance. But that's just the nature of the panel, there's not much you can do about that. But certainly, from a central position, uh, you get an absolutely stunning picture, uh, you know, bright, deep blacks, and um, re really, good, really accurate colors, too, thanks to the quantum dot. And uh, I've got to say, yeah, I was massively impressed because I've got to be honest, after last year, I wasn't expecting much. And uh, it blew me away, really, in terms of LCD. Now, in the conclusion of the uh, review, I, you know, I decided to give it a reference status badge because, in my opinion, when you're looking at LED LCD TVs, it's a reference point. And I think everyone needs to understand that reference status doesn't mean something's perfect because nothing, no consumer product no. is perfect. What we mean by that is that we're using it as a reference point. And I am. I'm going to use it. I mean, I've got one all the time. But as far as I'm concerned, that's a reference point for LCD televisions. Well, hopefully that's we, the reason for that. Hopefully function. we will have one on yeah. a 55-inch yeah. on long-term testing as well. So you can use it as a reference point. Against and LCD and it'll, be, it'll be used as a reference point. That's exactly what it will be used as. So yeah, I mean, and, and that and that's the reason behind it. I mean, and I know you could, for the last couple of years, I've been loath to award a reference badge because a there's been a lot happening, things have been changing so fast. You're thinking, well, you know, if I, you know, it'll be very different next year. But I think we've reached a point now where where things are fairly mature. I mean, yes, there are a couple of things on the horizon like you know higher frame rate and 8K. But to be perfectly honest, I don't see any way that they can deliver those in the next five years. So I think they're irrelevant. Um, everything else can still be done now with a modern television. So I think we reached a, a plateaued, a, a, a mature point in terms of technology for HDR, for example. And uh, so therefore, I think it is time to look at that. And, and then again, you can say, well, what about, you know, you've got LCD or OLED, but they're very different technologies and they have different strengths and weaknesses. So you can't say one is better than the other. You know, there's no question in my mind that when it comes to HDR, the uh, Q9FN delivered the best experience I've had because, you know, it had, I mean, I was measuring peak brightnesses in dynamic mode, admittedly, uh, over 3,000 nits. Um, it was doing just under 2,000 nits in the, in the, you know, calibrated movie mode. I mean, that's, that's, that's so, seriously So you did bright. end up, so you did end up with a tan over the bank holiday weekend. <laughs> yeah, 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 potentially. But, but you see this, the, again, this is the, the, the bit that people misunderstand. I mean, you're talking about specular highlights. Yeah, yeah. At, at those levels. And all that does is it just adds more realism and more, dynamic range into what you're watching so yeah. it's it's not about you know blowing your retinas and and, and all the rest of it because that's that's not what it's about um and high dynamic range has never been about that i mean it could be argued that in a dark room an oled would give you a better dynamic range even though they they're only hitting a thousand nits because well, again you're just talking about the specular highlights and and you're getting the pixel per pixel level with an oled and in a dark room you know, the Samsung might be a bit much. Well, um, I mean, that, that raises the issue of, you know, differing technologies, different strengths and weaknesses. Exactly. So for an OLED, uh, yes, you've got the deep, deep blacks. You've got specular highlights that can be delivered at a pixel level. Um, so there's greater precision. And you can get up to about 800 nits. Um, possibly a little bit higher, depending on how many. Obviously, if you measure a smaller and smaller window, you can get it a little bit higher. So very small spec highlights, probably approaching 900 nits. So for a 1,000 nit master content you're basically getting very there's minimal tone mapping, mapping being applied you're basically getting the experience and that's great however where OLED struggles is if it's a bright full image so for example the Revenant where you've got lots of um, uh, like white fields in snow covered fields it, it might struggle a little bit where because the, the, they can do about 150 nits on a full field pattern whereas um, uh, you know uh, an LCD can do you know way higher than that so that's, that's where it perhaps isn't as strong then you look at um, uh, an LCD television, and obviously you, you don't have the precision of a pixel-level specular highlight, but you do have a much higher peak brightness um, on a 10% window at least, and um, and obviously you know a lot a full field pan can be much brighter as well. So, like I say, they're not, um, and therefore, like you said, Phil, um, if you're using an OLED in a dark environment, it, it can look. I mean. It, in any environment, to be honest, yeah. but in those kind of environments, they can look absolutely stunning. Yeah, and it's, can look absolutely stunning. And another misconception is that it's all about the brightness. It's actually it's not all about the brightness. What HDR gives us is more de 
gradations and more steps um, in the at dark, both ends of the scale. Both ends of the scale, but more in the dark areas. Yeah. And their eyes are better at perceiving uh, images that are darker and within the shadows and so on. So it gives you that more pop and more depth, which is really what impressed me with the VW760 laser projector from Sony because it was doing that so well, you know, the way it came out of black. And OLED's the same. I mean, OLED's a lot darker. The blacks are a lot inkier than a projector. And, you know, you've got a lot more happening just above black as well. And um, that's what adds adds depth in there. So, again, it's another strength that one particular technology does a little bit better than the other. So yeah, we keep coming back to this, and we will be keep coming back to this throughout the year is that there is no perfect display and what you have to think about is your viewing environment your viewing habits and what it is that you want from the display that you have um, because there's not one that does them all it does everything really really well <laughs> they all have strengths and weaknesses and it's, and it's about basically picking your poison it's about picking which technology suits you better it's not about OLED is is the king and blah 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 and everything else is is rubbish. That's never been the case. It offers things to a certain sector, which happens to be a lot of AV Forums members who are movie watchers and who want to watch things as the director intended and so on, um, and in darkened environments. That's why OLED yeah, suits who them. Who are people who sit in dark rooms? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Which obviously isn't the majority of people. No, no. And, and of course, when we come to reviewing things as well, we can't just review for the AV Forums members, although th those people are our first point of call when it comes to assessing products. But you have to assess a TV as a TV. And I think there's, there's so many reviews now that are moving away from actually reviewing the TV as a TV. You know, what is, well, the, what is the tuner like? What's the UI like? Is it a, a nice experience to use it as a TV as opposed to using it as a monitor and just plugging everything into just the about HDMI. To come on to that. So, go on then. <laughs> because you're absolutely right. But, but there, and we've been guilty of this in the past where we've concentrated so much on picture quality that we've forgotten that actually, whilst yeah. that's all vitally important, you want you, know, you need a good picture quality. There's so much more to a television, particularly a modern television where it's been gone from being, you know, in the old days, it was just literally a screen that showed a TV picture. Things have moved on so much now and we need to look at those factors and address them and, and, and compare them in, in that sense as well. So picture quality on the Q9, uh, excellent. SDR, HDR, superb. Gaming, and we, we just mentioned this earlier with, with Mark, you know, if you're a gamer, it's awesome gaming TV because you've got, you know, obviously there's absolutely no danger of any kind of screen but image tension, you know, although even if, if we discovered so far with OLED, that's going to be the case anyway. But we know with LCD, that's not an issue. Incredibly bright. Um, so gaming and HDR looks stunning. Um, motion handling is really good. And also, it, de it, it detects uh, like an Xbox or a PS4, and it goes straight into game mode for you. And um, you don't have to do anything. It does it for you. Also, if you've got connected um, Samsung soundbar, that will go into the game mode as well. Um, and, it, and it will at some point, got, not yet. Sorry, sorry not. so it got low, low input lag for the game 21 mode? 21 milliseconds Can't of input lag, which is actually the same as the LG. <laughs> um, so your low input lag. Uh, and uh, also will support VRR at a very refresh rate um, at some point, but not yet. Um, but uh, I've got to say, yeah, as a gaming gaming uh, TV, it was, it was superb. So again, that's something that needs to be f f taken into account. Um, as an overall design, um, it's yeah, because it's got a direct LED backlight. It's a little thicker than, than a lot of modern TVs, but that's no big issue in my opinion. It's still only three centimeters deep, which is hardly massive. Um, it's got a kind of quite a simple monolith kind of design, very similar to the Sony's from a few years ago. Um, but it comes with the one connect box, which now has everything in it, all the connections and the power. So there's a single thin cable that goes to the TV, which I, I think is really clever. Uh, wall mounting, it could look stunning because you've only got that one cable to go to it, which you can easily hide. Um, the smart platform is excellent. Very reminiscent to WebOS, I have to admit, but I think it's it's fast, responsive. It works. It doesn't crash. Um, there was a f the free view the free view play catch up services were missing, but they are being added. Um, I think next week, so that's on its way. But otherwise, it had everything else. You know, Netflix. And anything it didn't have uh, is now TV. Um, but otherwise, it covers everything else. It's a very intuitive, responsive platform. You've got voice control. You've got Samsung's smart things app and you know you can have internet of things control of your you so say your tv can be a hub for your entire home again these are all factors that modern tvs have and most people are interested in even if you know we at av forms do tend to prioritize picture quality so uh, as, as an overall package as a television to use day in day out also it has got if you plug in a device it detects it automatically sets it up for you sets up the remote so you can use the tv remote as a universal remote <laughs> i mean really clever stuff like that so as, as an experience 
it's a fantastic TV to use. Um, you know, it looks great, it sounds great. It's you know, bigger TV, bit thicker. It's got slightly bigger, bigger drivers, so it's got better sound quality than, than a lot of TVs. And yeah, it's it's a really nice um, uh, user experience. So again, all these factors play play into my decision to award it a reference. But I think as a you know, as a, as a TV experience, particularly as an LCD television experience, it is a reference point. Good stuff, and I'm really looking forward to getting a 55 inch too. I mean, it, it'll be. A... I'm really curious to see what 55 looks like because we haven't had a 55 inch flagship. Yeah. Samsung for a while, a yeah. long time, in fact. Yeah, it's it's good that they have introduced that that screen size, and I think again it was a it was a misstep last year not to include that um, that screen size. I think and, they just want to forget last year. To be perfectly I, I honest. think so, <laughs> and you can't blame them. I mean, but they're back with a bang. So yeah, the back with a bang, and, and yet, yeah, like I say, it may be up to another six weeks or so before I get one in, but I will be getting one in to add to the the long term test, and, and I'm really really interested to see. Um, because I, you know, I live on my own, so I can sit in the sweet spot <laughs> with an LCD. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming this is full array. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did you have to count the the zones yourself, did. or did was? Uh, okay. I had to count. They did. Oh, okay. There's two not two answers here. One is they did tell me, but uh, off the record, so I didn't have to count, <laughs> count them myself. <laughs> Four hundred and eighty-eight. Yeah, which is not as many well, as as we were first led to believe. Um, ooh, well, ah, uh, yes. Now, weren't they talking about? But they were talking about the uh, QS, whatever they're going to call it. That's kind of come at Efa, right? Um, big eight okay, K. Okay, well, so I wasn't supposed to mention that. Thing. Oh no, no, I, I don't think it's a secret exactly because they were blabbing about it. Well, they were going on about it at CES and afterwards. They said, Can you not mention it? Well, it's a bit late now, isn't it? We've tweeted about it <laughs> on a video. <laughs> Um, but yeah, they've got something lined up for EFA, and that's going to be their big 8K model, um, and that that should be something special. But um, but also it's going to be astronomically expensive. Yeah, um, yeah. And a big but screen. I think it's, it's it sounds a little fun. bit though like it sounds a bit like like QLED this year is essentially what it was supposed to be last year. Yes. Yeah. That, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, the I guess then the only worry is is that there are a certain number of people who perhaps will kind of assume like the boy who cried wolf or something, and will not really investigated as much just assume they're trading off the kind of similarity to oled and and you know base their opinion on this year's sets on what happened yeah, last I, year I, I still don't like the the use of qled I, I i don't like that and i i can see why they do it um it's a bit it's it's, it's like the same as as when they uh initially launched the led backlighting and they called the tvs led tvs you know they weren't led tvs the had an LED backlight. It was all about marketing, and, and and a lot of the time, and hopefully we do it uh, in the editorial. It's cutting through that marketing and saying exactly what something is, and and so on. It's just I don't like the name QLED. And was isn't QLED or wasn't it the trade name for a completely different technology which they bought uh, and have yet to to bring to market, Steve? So again, there's the, the they seem to be using that name quite quickly, and I'm sure they're going to use micro LED at some point as well. Before. Well, that's it. I mean, to be honest, this is all of a bit of a stepping stone, isn't it? So last year they introduced the concept of QLED. This year they've kind of delivered on that concept. Yeah. But their ultimate end game is is a is a, a, a well. A micro LED television oh, yeah. where each pixel is composed of a red, green, and blue LED, uh, and I think you know we can all see the benefits of that because you're only going to get the best of all worlds: no screen burn, massive peak brightness, massively wide color gamuts, and absolute blacks. Yeah, but so, that's a, that's a mass, it's a massively long way away, and it's yeah, yeah. I mean, expensive. theoretically, it's the perfect television technology, yeah. but clearly, right now, they can't make in anything approaching a consumer price, so uh, or size. So um, that's sort of a way away. But that's their ultimate end game. Yeah. But, I mean, obviously, yeah. in the meantime, they have to sell TVs. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, well, that's it. It's it's just that when they start using those names, because there will be, I have no doubt, on next year's sets, they will call something micro LED, and it won't be the micro LED technology where it's per pixel RGB and all the rest of it. It'll be something else that they will market like that, because that's something that that company does, and it's really annoying when they do it. And I wish they wouldn't do it because I think it gets quite disingenuous. And it, well, does, yeah, and it doesn't and market, it doesn't right, help them, you know. So, but sometimes it works because I mean they were told off by it for using for calling LCD televisions LED TVs. But let's be honest, we just all refer to them as that now. <laughs> it's yes, just a shorthand, so, doesn't everyone knows what you mean? But yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So. Okay, well, I mean, we're, we're talking about reference points and all the rest of it, and <laughs> these these companies have to start somewhere. Um, so when you're talking about Samsung and LG, I mean, just going back 15 years ago, they they were nowhere to be seen when it came to TVs. Well, lucky Gold Star. Yeah. 
<laughs> they, they, they were nowhere to be seen or, or, or considered as, as serious brands, both Samsung and LG in the TV market. It was dominated by Japanese brands back then. How things have changed in 15 years. Yeah. And, and the thing is that LG, you know, in the era of the Scarlet TV, if people remember that, which was their first sort of real go at a higher end market when it came to their LCD TVs. And it was around about that time that they realised that the enthusiast market was going to be vital to them, which is why they, they had a forum on AV forums. And um, we did quite a bit of work with them in terms of what the enthusiast market was looking for, what picture controls and so on. And we did the same with with other companies, but it it, it allowed them to build up their technology, build up their TV brand for a certain sector of the market. We're not saying <laughs> we're responsible for the huge success they're having now, but certainly with the enthusiast market, with those people who, you know, their relatives go and ask them, you know, what TV should I buy and that kind of thing. It, it was important for them to to get the product out there to that market, which they did through AV forums and obviously the feedback from reviews and so on. And they built up a really nice following, which is now obviously paying off for them, not not only in the enthusiast market, but market wide. But they had to start somewhere and the products, let's be honest, back in the day were not great. And that was because they didn't have experience. They didn't really know what the whole market was looking for. And engineers don't necessarily know exactly how the content should be shown. And, and to explain that in a bit more, you know, Japanese engineers always used to set up picture modes with 9300 white point because that, that was the standard in Japan and that's what they were used to seeing. But in Western countries like the US and the UK and Europe, we're used to D65 and Hollywood produces to that standard and so on. So there was a bit of a culture there, which thankfully is now gone because I think a lot of the, the big Japanese companies are, are now all about director's intent and all the rest of it. And, you know, this is this has made our job a lot easier when it comes to testing TVs. But what I'm getting at is I've had a new brand through and the product's not great, which is a shame. But I think that they've got the makings of a really nice product if they just change a few things about it. And I'm talking about the electric uh, OLED TV. Now, this is a, this is a cheap OLED TV. How much it, does it cost? It, 849.99. Is yeah, the price. 55 inch, yeah. So a 55 inch 4K Ultra HD, um, and it is an LG panel. Yeah. So the panel is from LG, and it's not like two years ago, it's the latest panel that, that they can buy from LG Display. So to put it in context, you'd be looking at two and a half grand for a you LG would be. Or, a, yeah. or a Sony yeah. or a Panasonic or a Samsung Q9. Yeah. So the, the whole the idea of the brand is that, that they want to introduce technology, latent latest technology but without the brand price you know so you're not paying for the name or on it you're, you're paying for the the quality now they have cut corners to keep prices down uh, one is that it runs android but not not the, literally though i hope <laughs> but but not the android that sony and philips run this is android tv which normally runs on tablets and mobile phones um so you can still watch in 4k netflix um and so on but it's, it the operating system is Android uh, TV rather than the Android that the operating system that Sony and, and Philips use. Picture processing um, is obviously their chip, so they're not using a, they're using an, an off the shelf solution. They're not haven't developed anything on their own, and so on. And things like the design is um, it, it looks like an E series uh, LG with a with a sound bar at the bottom, although the sound bar is molded into the actual frame of the TV, but it looks like the the E series, um, probably an E7 mm. uh, if that makes sense, so it looks identical to that, but it's actually moulded into the frame. Uh, the feet are at, at either end of the screen which is annoying because it couldn't fit on my TV rack. I had to bring an old um, PC <laughs> uh, box and stick it a little bit further away so I had one leg on, on the, the TV rack and another leg on top of this PC thing just to make it fit because um, it was really quite wide with the feet at either end. The the thing was though, I didn't have to, <laughs> I didn't have to put it together when I got it out of the box, um, and it came in a huge box. I mean, this was like a sixty five inch TV box, massive, to protect it. The problem with the TV is picture quality, and and, and um, there's a few things that it does wrong. That's a pretty big problem. <laughs> yeah, there's a few things it does wrong. Now, for your typical man on the street who is used to buying his LCD TVs from Tesco's and, and, and places like that for four or 500 quid, it's about that level of picture quality. The problem is that the, the gamma is is way off. It, it starts at 2.4 in the blacks and then it goes all the way down to 1.6, which is mega bright. So you lose all detail in faces and so on. So everybody starts to look plasticine. 
because all the face lines and everything else is gone because the gamma curve is is too bright um and there's no gamma controls the, there's no there's no picture controls <laughs> so are there any controls so what you get is you get picture modes so there's dynamic vivid standard user and soft so the only one that gives you any control over the contrast and brightness is the user but that's it you get your contrast and brightness um and the color you know the color saturation control the global it's control like going back 30 years isn't it to yeah. tv's controls <laughs> um white white balance color temperature you get warm cool and standard um but the thing is that there's hardly any difference between dynamic uh vivid and standard because they all use the same gamma curve uh, which is way down at 1.5 1.6 the only one that, that looked anything approaching decent was soft. I don't know why they call this pic picture mode soft. Cause it wasn't, it's not reselling it, is it? <laughs> it? It wasn't soft. I think it's been lost in translation because obviously it's a Chinese-built yeah. uh, thing. So I think it's been lost in translation, the meaning of soft. It, it wasn't a soft image. But it had a, a little bit better gamma curve. But again, it was still 1.8, um, which is no good. And, and you know, colors were 709, and that, that was it. They were seven oh nine, um, but the problem was. Is it was, an HDR TV? It is an HDR TV, and the thing is that the Xbox One X was reporting back that the TV and the EID was saying that it could accept everything, um, which is a nice little checker. If you've got an Xbox One X, you can go in and check, and it it, it reads the the data from the TV, and it'll tell you what it will expect. So it was saying it it would accept everything, HDR ten, um, HLG, all the rest of it. Uh, it gets fifty nine percent of Rec twenty twenty. Um, it's the problem was that the primaries and secondaries, the gamma luminance, was just really low, went incredibly low. Um, so what was happening was your seventy-five point was round about rec seven or nine, and then your hundred percent point was suddenly out to where it should be when you were looking at the uh, the wider color gamut. So there's a the color was all over the place basically, um, and and again, you know, image quality it was like an LCD TV from ten years ago, which is a shame because. And, and again, it points to, you know, what the electronics are behind the panel because it's an LG panel. It's the latest LG OLED display panel. It's just the processing is really bad in it. The image quality, um, the fact that you can't adjust any of the picture modes, you can't adjust the gamma. There is no gamma control. If you could adjust the gamma and get it tracking at 2.4, I suspect it would be a really, really nice looking picture. Um, and it's such it's a... at least got good blacks. <laughs> yes, it's got good blacks. But the, but the problem is everything else is just... God damn awful. All over the shop. <laughs> yeah, it's all over the place. And, and it's a real shame because we've got to be honest with these things. And, and it might be an OLED TV, but it comes to image quality. It, it, but it just, the annoying thing is it's just little tweaks here and there that if they introduced it, they would have a hit on their hand. They really would. Because I think if, if they took some time to add picture modes in and give us gamma controls and so on, or gamma selection so you can select a 2.2, 2.4, 2.6 curves, uh, or an 1886 curve, or uh, for PQ, for HDR. Because that was the thing with, with PQ, um, it was it, it was nowhere close to tracking PQ. And it was rolling off at 300 nits. I mean, it, it could only do 328 nits on a, on a 5% window. On a 10% window, it was 318 nits. Full full field. It was it was eighty three nits. Sounds about right. Um, and the the lag for gaming, um, I couldn't get it to work HDR. There were, I think 4K. there's no game mode. There's no there's game no mode. game mode now. Sixty two milliseconds, and that's an SDR. Um, but the thing is, there's no when when you use the HDMI's, there's no scaling. So if you feed the ten eighty p signal in, um, your ten eighty p is is a square in the middle of the screen. <laughs> Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, you know, anyone who's thinking, I know it got a lot of cut, in, a lot of talk on it on, on the forums, but yeah. because of the price, but for one thousand four hundred ninety-nine quid, you can get a B seven, and that's in a different universe. Isn't it, it? it is, yeah, and 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 that's the issue. But the thing is, the thing is, Steve, though, if they take some of this feedback on board and make some tweaks and introduce gamma controls and, and all the rest, of it, I don't know how much that would cost them to do that. This is the thing, you know, they're trying to get this product out at eight hundred and fifty quid. If they could just do that and up, update it um, so you had some control over the image quality, I do think they would have a, a real sort of bargain option for people who want an OLED on the cheap that looks half decent. 
Um, the problem is the video processing doesn't work. There's no gamma control, and gamma's way down. It, it, I keep saying way down, but that's actually bright. <laughs> I know the terminology yeah. all over the place. It's yeah. counterintuitive, but um, you know it's down at 1.5, 1.6, and that's just too bright. You get no detail in faces at all, and colours are all over the place. Everything's clipped. Is it? Everything is clipped to hell. Um, and you know, it would, all it would take would be some tweaks. And obviously, we will feed this back to Electric. Um, they're a brand of appliances direct uh, retail. We're going to feed all this back to them because we think they have the makings of a good product here if they just take some some of this feedback and re-engineer a little bit on it. And I think they would have a, a really half decent product. Um, it wouldn't. It still wouldn't be up there with the LGs and so on because they haven't got that processing behind them. But if they could change just the way that the the, the picture modes are set up and give it a di- you know a gamma choice and so on and and color gamut, if if it can't do white color, then stick to seven or nine. But just give us a, yeah. a, a, an accurate picture or a more accurate picture, and there are some nice things about it as well. Uh, you know, it, it's not all bad. You know, it's a nice design. It looks nice. It, it, the thing is, it, when it comes down to picture, and for AV forums members, uh, you know, do not go near it with a barge pole. I could see other consumers not even noticing, Steve, because when you see how some TVs are come out of the box, yeah. um, you can appreciate that. And we've done the experiments at Bristol where we had a really god-awful image, but it was bright, but it was completely blue and all the rest of it, and it was showing the matrix, and it should be green, and it wasn't. It was blue, and it was completely off, off and we had two calibrated displays next to it. And my opening line in, in every session was, which TV do you think is, or which picture do you think is the best? And everybody pointed to the bright one. Um, mm. Not and it wasn't until you actually started picking out, you know, the, the image is too blue and it's not right and look at the faces, you're losing detail it wasn't until you actually went into that and this is with general public um, that people start to realise that, oh yeah and then they, nav- you know, they, they naturally migrate to the calibrated image and understand what it is they're seeing and so on and like I, like I say, I mean, there, there's these cultural differences, and this is a Chinese brand. There is there are some things in here which are obviously lost in translation, and I think it just needs some feedback, some genuine, honest feedback, and it might improve the product. Um, and it'd be nice to have a, an option at a lower price point that gives a, a half decent image, or certainly one that you have some control over and, and can make uh, it make it look half decent. Yeah. So it was an experience. Looking at that, and, and it's nice to, and, and again, you know, it's an area of the market that we don't generally look at because I, I think a lot of our readers and listeners are, are more in the mid range and up when it comes to their TVs because it's, it's what they, they're they interested in, it's what their hobbies are about, and so on. Um, but it is interesting to see that um, level of the market and see what you're actually getting for your money around there. How much are you getting, basically? And are you getting mm. anything that approaches accuracy? And unfortunately, with the electric. 55 OLED, 850 quid. It's still a miss. I'm hoping that they're going to take the feedback on board. So we'll see. So um, I finished that the other night and got it all filmed and everything and, and moved out of the way because I had a delivery on Wednesday, Steve. I had a 55-inch LG C8 turn up. Yeah. And I was I was dead excited to get it set up because it's been a little while since I've had an LG OLED in, in the house. And it's the first one of our long-term TVs that's that's actually turned up. So this is. I can't. I'm trying to think when you laugh, when if you ever had an LG OLED in the house. Yes, I have, but it was it was way back in the day. Yeah. Because <laughs> obviously for the last two years you've been you've been doing the vast majority of stuff for us on AV forums, and I've been doing other things. But I was excited to get it set up. And again, this is one of our long-term TVs. It's in for long-term testing. It is a retail sample, so it it came in the full retail packaging. You know that thing when you get a new phone, Stephen, and you know the the cover that goes over the screen? Yeah. And Mark, you'll be the same, and you peel it off and you get that satisfying sort of mm-hmm. peeling noise. When, you, Well, I, I'm i used to having review samples, and you'll be the same, used to having review samples come through. So it was nice to get a retail sample that yeah, came in. Yeah, you don't get that experience when in it comes retail, in a flight case. <laughs> yeah. It came in retail packaging, and... Um, you know, taking it to bets and and taking it out of the box, you know, it's completely different to, you know, <laughs> the packaging that that a lot of the review samples come in. And the whole, the thing was, the whole of the front screen was covered in one of those plastic covers. So I yeah. got the sensation, the one the one and only sensation of peeling it all off. It was fantastic. 
Did you uh, get any problems assembling the stand? Because initially I, I couldn't quite yes, work I, out. Yes, I, I did it wrong first because I put the back. <laughs> Me too. I, I put the back of it in first it and then realised. It's not that obvious, yeah. I've yeah. got to say, when you yeah. first try and assemble it. It's like, I, yeah. I know it's meant to do this, but why isn't that fitting but, in? But of course, yeah. you know, of course, typical blokes, because we don't look at the instructions. We just think, oh, I know what I'm doing here. So I put the back of it on and then realised I need, what I needed to do was assemble the stand and then put yes, it on. Yes, first. <laughs> yeah, so. And but even say, that bit wasn't actually that obvious. I looked at the the instructions and I thought oh hang on is no, that the, there does that clip in there yeah it was, it's terrible it was fiddly. the instructions are terrible you're looking at yeah. it and it makes no sense whatsoever but I figured it out and I figured out where all the screws because it was like there was nine screws and I'm thinking well hang on a minute I can only see six yeah there's two that go in at the bottom there's, aren't there, yeah there's two that go in at the bottom <laughs> and it's like oh so I figured it out anyway and the thing was that when we saw this at CES I wasn't a big fan of the stand you know the curved stand I, I yeah. wasn't a big fan of that at the time and I thought hmm don't know if I like that. However, now that it's now sitting on the TV rack, and it's got that lovely gunmetal grey finish to it, and the other thing is that it helps so much with the audio, which is obviously oh, what it's I designed it. to do. I love it. I, I think, think it's, it's gorgeous. great. And it's, the way it directs the sound towards yeah. the listener, the viewer, yeah. uh, works really well as too. too. It's a yeah. superb yeah. piece yeah. of and, design. And I've got to say, as a TV, it's probably one of the best sounding TVs I've heard for a long time. The actual sound quality that you yeah, get. You out consider of how thin that television is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They're, they're putting some fantastic tricks in there in terms of delivering. Yeah. Uh, just not just the actual audio physically, but also then you've got the the smart audio feature, which I think actually can work quite well, and also Dolby Atmos, which yeah. um you know, obviously I don't expect miracles here, but you do get a greater sense of immersion from it. Yeah. When you, you watch things off Netflix, for example, with Atmos yeah. soundtracks. Yeah, um, it, I found it, it in terms of uh, probably the first TV I've had in for a while where I thought I can live with this. I'm I, I'm quite happy to sit down and live with it. And then picture quality wise, wow, it really is yeah. a even out of the box. And I haven't measured it yet, but even out of the box, I was like, wow, this is this looks really really good. Out of the box measurements on mine uh, was a 65 inch, but it was uh, they're all under two. Yeah, I mean, um, you could see that just by eye, just thinking this is this yeah, is this is bang on. on. Yeah. Um, and the same, and also in HDR as well. The, the accuracy was very good. Um, yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, I've got to say, um, you know, I, I, yes, you could look at this this generation and look at last generation. Well, there's not a massive difference, and that is true. But they've definitely made tweaks that I think have uh, have, Im- have improved the picture quality in some areas, not so much in other areas, but certainly yeah. overall. Um, you know, comparing it to the B7, for example, which I've got to compare it to, um, the, the, it's just that little bit more, you know, uh, assured and a uh, little bit more competent. Uh, I just think it's just a, something about it. It's just slightly, slightly better. Um, just they just sort of tweaked everything a little bit, and um, the overall picture quality, I've got to say, it's abs- at times. <laughs> Breathtaking, yeah, absolutely yeah. breathtaking. I've, I've, you think, bloody hell, that looks good. Yeah, and I haven't even calibrated this one yet, and it's like you know, it's, it is absolutely spot on now. Maybe like you get it, onto the old auto calibration too, because well, um, there, there, there are a few things like the the new features that are in there. So, so let's go through them because obviously you've spent some time testing. Like I say, I only got my TV on Wednesday, and I've only used it you know yesterday, um, really. And, and set it all up and, and got all my accounts and everything set up for streaming services and so on. So I haven't really had a lot of time to spend with it. But my first impressions are that it's really, really nice. There are some issues, though, and, and the first one was, for me was motion uh, because the first thing I wanted to try was the BFI, the black frame insertion, and see how that works. And it's unusable. For, for yeah, me, a bit of a disaster. For, for me personally, it's unusable because of the flicker rate. And I've got a plasma, I've got a Pioneer Kuro sitting on the floor, I'm going to switch that on and just see because I think there's an interesting experiment to be had because I haven't watched a, a plasma image or a flickering image for a while and I just want to see if my eye picks up on that like it di- did with the, the BFI functionality because it's just too much of a flicker. and it Yeah, really, I've got really to say, motion is an interesting thing because everyone perceives motion differently. So exactly. I've got a friend who bought an A1, Sony A1, and, and generally I think we can all agree that Sony uh, deliver great motion a lot yeah, of the time. Yeah. He bought an A1, and he's a big football fan, big gamer. He hated it. He said he just couldn't handle the motion and changed it for something else. Right, yeah. He got a 79. Um, another friend of mine got an A1, big football fan, big gamer, loves it. Um, thinks the motion is amazing. He's got other issues with it recently, thanks to the most recent DV update. But um, certainly motion-wise, he loves it. So two completely different experiences with the same television. Yeah. I've got to say, I think the motion with true motion off on this TV is better than on the B7, and I think it looks great. Yeah. But I agree with you. 
you stick on the black frame insertion, obviously it dims immediately because it's a black frame being inserted, but there is obvious flicker. Now, interestingly, uh, I got an early look at this last year and it looked better then, but I noticed that they didn't demonstrate BFI at the event in Madrid. And I was wondering why, because I thought, that's a new feature, aren't they showing it off? And now I know why. Um, something's gone wrong there. Because, yeah. <laughs> yes, there was quite noticeable flicker. And I don't normally get... I do get flicker sometimes with BFI, but not always. Um, but this time, it was very noticeable. Yeah, it was. Um, which is a shame. It was. And, and the other the other thing is that... Um, I keep calling it smooth gradation, but I, I need to be careful there, because that's Sony's terminology. Yeah, it's a decontouring feature. It's a decontouring feature. And it, the thing is, though, it's under... Um, noise reduction settings. Yeah, it's in the low setting there, and the problem is that it is doing noise reduction as well as. Yeah, they've got unfortunately, and this is, sounds silly, but it's easier for them to add a feature than it is for them to change the menu. Yeah. So next year, the menu will have decontouring as a separate feature. Yeah. And it will work just like Sony. But unfortunately, right now they've lumped it in with the low MPEG noise reduction feature, so you're still getting yeah. a bit of noise reduction on top of the decontouring. Yeah, which, which I've got to say does work though. The decontouring does work. Um, but yeah, you're going to lose some fine detail with the, with the noise reduction, unfortunately. Yeah. So I, I guess it it'll come down to how anal you are about your image quality. And I mean, you know, myself and Steve are really quite. You know, we go back to the old school of if as long as it's not interfering with how the image is supposed to be seen or or changing the image too much, then then it's fine. Anything else is is a take it or leave it personal preference thing. And and the problem is that we get really quite anal. So it might be that you use it if you buy this set, and think it looks great. Because it does work. It's just it is taking some fine detail out of the image a little bit with the with the noise reduction. But apart from those two things, um, which are slight negatives, I've got to say, overall, I'm loving this TV, even though I've only had it a day or so. And, you know, I might fall out of love with it. It's certainly something we're going to keep coming back to over the weeks, over the summer and so on, with the football and the World Cup and everything else. You know, these TVs are here to keep for a while and to test with everything and, and to test as TVs in, in, in the real yeah. world. So it's going to be interesting. Well, I'll tell you what, a feature that is on the TV that was on last year's TV, but again, it was the same problem as with the decontouring. It was, wasn't was a separate control initially because they had to lump it in with dynamic contrast, but now it's a separate control, dynamic tone mapping. That works brilliantly. Absolutely brilliant. I <laughs> that love absolutely that. absolutely amazing. <laughs> it's really, really good. <laughs> now, now, it might not be technically correct. So again, this is a thing where it comes with personal preference, but it was one of these little little things that when you switched it on, and obviously it, it doesn't work with Dolby Vision material because Dolby Vision does you its own. You don't need it. But with HDR10 material, it, it really does make a difference. Um, yeah. and, it, and it looks really nice. And I'm thinking that they've introduced this as a way to combat HDR10 Plus because well, I think it looks different. exactly the same. Yeah, they, they said, I said to them, why aren't you putting HDR10 Plus on your TV? They said, because basically the way it works is that, you know, it's an automatic feature when they're encoding it anyway. We can basically mimic that with our dynamic uh, tone mapping feature. Uh, and I've got to say, if you if you measure it with it off, out of the box, it tracks PQ absolutely spot on. Okay. If you put, turn it on, it, it just makes a massive difference to the image. But if you put on something like, say, the arriving Neverland scene with the sun behind the mountain, which is 4,000 nits, there's no clipping there. So it's not clipping the highlights. Uh, I don't, you know, It just works really well at creating, you know, particularly, say, scenes where it's been mastered at a very high nit rate. Um, but you're looking at a dark scene. Sometimes with OLEDs, you could get you get the image could be a bit too dark. Yeah. It just eliminates that issue completely. It also helps with the uh, brighter overall scenes as well. I think it's an incredible feature now, and it works brilliantly. I haven't tried it with gaming yet, but I, again, I think this is an area when you're talking about that stuff that's been done, done at a high uh, net value because I think a lot of the games are, are actually 10,000. 10, yeah. So it could be a, a nice feature for gaming as well because LG got a lot of stick last year for one of the, the updates that they did for HDR gaming. I don't know if you saw it, Mark, or not with your B7, but um, if it was if it's a high nit, it was reading it wrong and it was making the image too dark. Um, yeah. So hopefully that's not going to be a case this year. And again, we've got them for long term testing. We've got I've got an Xbox One X here um, for HDR testing with the games and stuff like that. So we'll keep an eye on it. Um, and obviously anything that, that we notice. The idea is that we're going to feed it back to the manufacturers this year. So, yeah, as as a CA, um, what are you scoring it as, Steve? I, I'm uh, I'm going to I'm using the same same logic I applied to the Samsung. To be honest, for me, it's a reference point. Okay. Um, I think it's uh, yeah. It, I think it's it delivers absolutely everything I would want from a television. It looks fantastic with SDR and HDR. Yeah. Okay, yes, it's not as peak. The peak brightness is about 100 nits, so comparing it to the Q9, it's not as bright. But, you know, it, it, the picture looks fantastic. Um, the platform, the smart platform, WebOS, still the best. I was, I was just going to come on to this because... copy that. Yeah. It's by far and away the most intuitive, 
the most comprehensive. It's got every single streaming service, including Now TV and all the catch-up services, everything you can want. The Magic Motion Remote is brilliant. I was, I mean, you can no, use that was one thing. Want, but... That was one thing I was worried about because I, th- I thought I would hate that. Because it I've, took I've, me a while to get used to it. But now, any old, and yet now you're used to it. Any other remote control just seems antiquated in comparison, doesn't it? it? it you does pick up a remote for something you else, shake it. and you go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I I wasn't sure how I was going to take that. And like I say, I've only had the TV. I've only been using it for maybe a day and a half, maybe two days maximum. And it's already second nature. Uh, and yep. the, the menu system and how to get into the things that I want and how to select HDMI inputs or how to select an app and all the rest of it. Uh, it's now muscle memory, and that's after a day and a half using that remote. Um, it's and it's, it's really intuitive. It's really, really intuitive. It's fast, it's yeah. stable, there's no dropouts. No, I mean... You know, if you take it as an overall package, so plat- smart platform, spot on. Features, spot on. Covers uh, HDR10, hybrid log gamma, Dolby Vision. Um, you know, it's got dynamic tone mapping um, feature, which works really well. So, you know, I, coverage-wise, that's brilliant. Um, the sound quality that you mentioned is surprisingly good, considering, you know, it's an ultra-thin television. Um, I think the design's gorgeous. I mean, it, everything. I, I, I've, it's hard for me to fault it, really. What about? I, I'm, looking, I'm, I'm nitpicking, but I'm, when I'm saying, okay, black frame doesn't work very well, and the decontouring, unfortunately, is also lumped in with the noise reduction. Yeah. When well, you're looking, if those are the only problems I could come up with. Yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> that's like, not a lot, is it? Yeah. You I mean, did like, mention with the, sorry, you did mention with the Samsung Q9 about uh, variable refresh rate. Is the bit, there been anything from LG no, about they that? Mentioned. I don't think they're intending to add that, at least not this generation. They certainly yeah. haven't mentioned I think if they were going to do it, they would have made a big deal about it, and they didn't mention it. Um, but, but again, it comes back to, you know, we're banging on about how good this TV is. And, and that's just because we've both seen it. I mean, I'm sure I'll be banging on about the Q9 when I eventually get to get to have one and, and spend some time with, and living with it and so on. But again, it comes down to what is going to suit you in your environment and with the material that, that you watch. Um, and the thing is, you know, we've got two absolutely cracking TVs here. And that and those are the first two TVs that have come through for review this year. Yeah. Well. There's, there's been three TVs, the XF90. I've seen that as well. The review will be going up there this week. Um, and again, that's an that, example that, of where black frame insertion really does work. Yes, that was really good. And and for a mid range TV, um, uh, apart from uh, the operating system and the user interface, which which is naff, <laughs> absolutely. Well, you naff. know, that's a big. You, you might laugh, but that's a big deal. I mean, you said to me, yeah. which I rather, rather have a C8 or an A1 or an AF8 from Sony. No question in my mind, I'm going to go for the LG every time. And for well, two reasons. One, smart platform is streets ahead, and Android I don't trust. And secondly, their implementation of Dolby Vision has been an absolute dog's dinner. Yeah. Uh, and I've had nothing but bad things from friends who've got Sony's yeah. about the whole conference. Well, I've, I've got one turning up on Tuesday. So there's a 55-inch yeah. EF8, and I believe that the... And again, that's a retail sample um, purchase, so, so I'll get that sensation of and and, and parking again. <laughs> um, but obviously we're trying to get a review sample in for the 65 as well so we're not just going to be sticking your elbows in boxes <laughs> <laughs> my house is like Carrie's stock room it really is uh, it's it's where to put all the boxes because obviously we're, yeah. we're going to um, sell these TVs on at the end of the year once we're finished with them so you know AV Forums members you might be getting a bargain if you keep an eye on calibrated and they'll be calibrated yeah <laughs> Um, but yeah, d- at the minute it's keeping the boxes and, and so on. It's a good job that I don't have another half in here to complain about stuff because <laughs> literally his boxes lying everywhere. Uh, but yeah, the AF8 turns up and then we're just waiting on the Panasonic, which is going to be the end yeah, of May. Yeah, Panasonic, I like their smart platform. It's simple. It's not as, as sophisticated as WebOS, but it does the job and, it, and it's reasonably robust and, and easy to use. Yeah. But no Dolby Vision. And I know Panasonic will say, and Samsung as well, will say like, well, you know, we do HDR10+. But let's be honest here, HDR10+, okay, Amazon support it. That's it. <laughs> that is literally it. Whereas Dolby Vision, I've got discs coming in this month particularly. They will all seem to have Dolby Vision now. Yeah, you'll be surprised. I choose use it. You're like and, me because I've been buying loads of discs as well, Steve. We'll come on to that movie section. Dolby Vision, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's becoming sort of the de facto so, standard. Dolby Vision so. is becoming de facto uh, format for dynamic metadata, and, and yeah. you know, I, I'm a, I think HDR10 Plus has missed the boat. It's come, come and gone. Yeah. Uh, so again, that's another factor why I would would move towards an LG. Yeah. So there we go. We've revealed the TVs that we're going to have on long term testing this year. So it's it is the C8 from LG 55 inch. We're waiting on a 55 inch Q9 from Samsung, a 55 inch AF8 from Sony, 
and the final TV once they arrive, and I think they're a little bit late coming this year, it's going yeah. to be end of May, is the Panasonic, and we're going with the 802, and the only reason we're going with the 802 is I don't need the soundbar on the 952. Well, no, yeah, they're mean, so. TVs, but just one of the soundbar and one doesn't, so. Yeah. It's not the 952, that was last year's model. What's the... It's, uh, it's, it's the... Um... No, it is not. It's the FZ nine five two. FZ nine five two. See, I, uh, these model numbers get oh, confused. Yeah. EZ, FZ, <laughs> but EXXE. Is uh, yeah, so uh, they're identical TVs. It's just one has a sound bar and one doesn't. So we're having the one without because uh, the way that we're going to put these together for um, comparison testing and all the rest of it is we've got two floor stands. With your Meccano set. <laughs> Meccano sets. Uh, I've only built one so far. Christ, that was that was hard work. Um, but yes, we'll be setting those up, um, we'll be testing those, and then once we've got everything set up, we'll be starting to do comparison tests, we'll start to look at all the different uh, UI user interfaces, uh, operating systems, and doing some real in-depth stuff. Um, a lot of that will be on video as well. So that's what we're planning on doing over the summer, and it's a great summer to be doing that because we've got the World Cup and there's other sporting events and so on, which, which are always difficult. Uh, material for TVs and some do them better than others and like you say Steve I mean it, it can even vary from person to person really in terms of how motion works yeah we hopefully we'll so get some so. more BBC HLG tests because last time they didn't what, announce until afterwards I know <laughs> like, that was that was really <laughs> annoying but I'll tell you what that H, uh, HLG demo that runs with the Leopard and so on and on, uh, on the C8 uh, well it's on the C8 it was on the XF90 as well um, oh it looks stunning on the C8 absolutely beautiful um Especially the the slow motion bits with the water droplets yeah. and stuff, and yeah. the, the little insects. Oh, it looks stunning. So, so you got stunning. HLG on iPlayer to work on the Sony. Yes, I did. Yes. Right. Yeah. I was like someone, another manufacturer, granted, was telling me that Android wasn't supporting that. So. Uh, no, it is there. If you go into beta, and it's there to, sell, to select, and um, I actually videoed the TV with that running. So the video review of the XF90 will actually have HLG stuff running in it. Probably breaks copyright laws, but who cares? Looks great. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it'd be nice if they do some more t- tests with football and stuff in HLG because uh, it would and live I, streams. I'd, I've actually um, uh, bookmarked the blog, the technical blog, just to see if they mention it on there again. Um, hopefully, yeah. hopefully before they do any testing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah rather than after. <laughs> Well, it'd be nice of them just to do it afterwards, but have it there on the on the beta page for people to to load and watch. Because again, it'd be good for them to see how uh, how that works in a in I'll a live Another feature: these are little things, but they'd make a difference as far as I'm concerned. Is is when the an LG TV goes into an HDR mode, it tells you that. So it says HDR or yes. HLG HDR or Dolby Vision in the corner of the screen. Yeah. Whereas the Sony. It does say HDR. It says it? HDR, no, but you have to bring the menu up to check. Yeah, uh, and the subs doesn't say anything. No, it just goes no. into it. it yeah. you... That was one one of my little pet peeves with the LG. I've got to say is the lack of an info button. There is an Some... info button. Just press the uh, you just press the center wheel. But that doesn't automatically bring up what resolution. Uh, oh yeah, but then if, if, you, if, you, if, you, if the thing that comes up in the right left hand corner, then put the cursor over it and click enter again, and it'll bring up more info. That's a faff, isn't it? <laughs> Two button presses. Yeah, but there's no info button because they've simplified this magic remote. But you can you can get all It's the not Cape Canaveral, Steve. I'm not doing it. <laughs> yeah, so like you say, TV season is is well underway. Um, so far, so good. So far, well, so well. If well, you know, <laughs> apart from the electric, but then I wasn't expecting much from them, and I, I think it's a good feedback exercise as well. So it was nice to see what. Uh, is available at that level of market and we fed it back and hopefully they'll come back to us with some changes on that one we might even test it again um and and see if they if they go down that route and see if they can improve it so um, if it's yes. anything like the budget brands they get in the states and places you know when like the high sense and that kind of thing then you know they could move on leaps and bounds in just a few years if they take on feedback. Uh, absolutely, I mean just look at Hisense; they are they are now one of the fastest growing brands. Um, TCL have now entered the UK market again, another Chinese manufacturer. Um, their stuff's getting getting good feedback. We've yet to see them, but um, hopefully we'll get some review samples through soon. Um, and then you've got other brands coming back as well under the Vestal um, side of things. So Toshiba are back. Um, so it'll be interesting to see some of their stuff, Steve. Uh, yeah, definitely. So, Hisense and TCL, really interesting to see what they come up with this year. Yeah, 
Uh, so hopefully we'll be getting out those through as well soon. Um, well, hopefully from High Sense because they're sponsoring the World Cup. So you would think they're going to have their TVs out <laughs> in, this, yeah. in stores pretty quickly uh, for that. And um, we also have some articles and stuff going up uh, in terms of picture settings for sport and so on. Mark uh, Hodge is working on those at the minute. Um, so hopefully they'll be up probably uh, middle of the month to the end of the month before the World Cup kicks off. On the, I think it's the 14th of June it kicks off. Yeah, that's right. First game's 14th of June, so not that far away. I'm actually really looking forward to it uh, this time around. I think it's going to be interesting. Right, so that's it for hardware. Um, we need to talk about some movies next. <laughs> Okay, so uh, moving on to movie news and reviews. There's no reviews this week because there's been nothing at the cinema. I actually went to see Infinity War again for the second time. I was at a loose end. I was near the Metro Centre and I just thought, you know what, I'm going to go to the cinema. And then I forgot there was nothing else on apart from Infinity War, so I went and seen that again. Did you um, enjoy it second time around? Yeah, it's, it's, it's still still a pretty, pretty good pretty, pretty good movie. Um, it's so done quite well. <laughs> it has. It's, it's, it's done really well, hasn't it? Really. So. It beat... Uh, Force Awakens for the biggest opening weekend both, uh, actually interestingly the biggest opening weekend in America it, it didn't actually make the biggest opening weekend globally because uh, it didn't open in China until, it doesn't open in China until next week um, so bizarrely the fate of the furious still has that record uh, but yes it, it, it beat the Force Awakens in the States for the biggest opening weekend it made over half a billion um, in its opening weekend worldwide it, actually no sorry it made more in its opening weekend it made over 600 million, 650 million. Basically, it made as much in its opening weekend globally as Justice League did in its entire run. <laughs> <laughs> Within a week, it had made more globally than Batman vs. Superman, the most successful DC uh, movie, had made <laughs> its entire run. It has absolutely stormed it. Um, made the most, uh, it was the fastest to a billion dollars ever. Um, yeah, and like I say, it comes out, opens in China this week, so that's going to be another few hundred million coming in straight away. So I reckon it's on course to probably pull in a couple of billion worldwide. I, I think you were the only person that hadn't seen it when we reviewed it last week, Mark. So have you had a chance to... Uh, not last week, so we're on holiday last week, but the week before. Week so have you had a chance to see it yet? Uh, no, I haven't yet, but that, part of that's the reason... Uh, well, the reason for that is um, I want to catch up on some of the other Marvel films. <laughs> because when I, when I want... Uh, when I went to watch uh, Black Panther, someone explained to me I, I didn't get a particular bit, and they said, "Oh no, that was explained in uh, Civil War." And now I've kind of realised that I've got to kind of go back through all the Marvel films to try and exactly, uh, you know, I, I'm a little bit kind of mixed up on on the continuity of it all. You know, some people seem to be able to get their heads around what's going on, but you know, I, I'd like to not kind of end up going, uh, "Who's that guy again?" What's, yeah, what's going yeah. on here? You know, so, uh, yeah, I, I feel like I almost need to go back and watch all... How Do your homework. Think. Yeah, I, I, I <laughs> yeah. think I think there is a big payoff if and and if you're more invested in it than, than I certainly was first time when I, I saw Infinity War. There was a lot of mo- emotion going on on screen where I was like, yeah, whatever. I'm not really invested <laughs> in you. Don't, you know? But I think if I'd seen the, the, those, those movies, which I'm making an effort out to try and... Um, catch up with stuff that I haven't That's seen. That's the thing. You you start off only watching the films about the characters that you like or the ones that you're mildly interested in. Yeah. But then the fact that it, it, it there's so much crossover is you end up kind of having to watch the ones, you know, I've got no great Which interest in watching genius, Ant-Man. Isn't it? Because yeah, you're... yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. You so see, by, the, by the end, it's, it's like a kind of pyramid scheme where, you know, at the top of it is, is Infinity <laughs> War and then you, they get everyone watching it. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that there is there's certainly a bigger payoff if if you are up to date with yeah. the thing and you've got some investment in the character, some emotional investment in the characters, definitely. Because there was, you know, even on second view, and I'm like, yeah, I still don't get this, but I, I need to, you know, invest in that character and uh, and spend some time. But again, it's it's having the time and it's catching up with those movies. But yeah, it makes me want to go and see it again, um, and and see stuff that I haven't seen yet. So. Um, there's there's a pool there, and I was never one for the the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And the thing is, a lot of the time, the only reason I went to see these films was there was nothing else on at the cinema at the time, and I've got my limitless card. <laughs> so mm. so for a lot of these films, like Thor Ragnarok, I would never have chosen to pay to go to the cinema to see that. But because I had my limitless card, and there was nothing else being opened around that film, it was the only thing showing. Sure. I you know so in a kind of roundabout way, I've got myself into the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. <laughs> because I've got a limitless card, and that's probably the only reason why. Because um, apart from Iron Man, and uh, I never 
never got into the Captain America stuff. I never got into a lot of the other stuff other than um, the Should really they, commercial Winter stuff. Winter Soldier was actually probably the best Marvel movie. I've actually got them on my list, uh, but it's the it's the middle and end movie of that trilogy, and I haven't seen the first movie. Oh, and first it, Avenger. And yeah, and it's not on uh, Netflix, but the other two are. So I'm kind of like, where am I going to get that one from? I might have to buy it on iTunes or rent it on iTunes. Oh, yeah, because you know, you've got your Apple TV. You can just do that, can't you? Yeah, I've got my Apple TV now. What a great little device that is. But let's, let's talk about, Honestly, yeah, let's, let's talk about movies. <laughs> 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 we've, we've done enough hardware for this week. Uh, yeah, it is a great little device. Right, so that's done really well this week. Avengers Infinity War, well, that's two weeks. Uh, but there is a film coming out this week. Uh, it opens on Tuesday, actually, Steve. And, yeah, um, I'm going to see on Tuesday night. I'm going on Thursday. I, I couldn't quite make the Tuesday, uh, the Tuesday show, and so I'm going to go and see it on the Thursday. But that's Deadpool 2. The first movie, I think it shocked a lot of people as to just how good it was and how adult funny. it was and how funny it was and how over the top the language was um, and how knowing and, and breaking that fourth wall. Um, yeah, there were some cracking jokes like when the yeah. <laughs> Cyclops, it's not Cyclops, Colossus grabs him and goes, I am taking you to see Professor. And he goes, which one, McAvoy or Stuart? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. These timelines get so confusing. <laughs> That's great yeah, no, it's it's very very knowing, and I, I adore it for that. I think it's a it, and it works because it could have fallen flat in its face taking well, that approach. Fox didn't want to make it, but yeah. um, they sort of got pushed into a corner. Ended up being the most successful uh, X Men movie <laughs> they've released. Yeah, uh, obviously it's also Marvel again, so you no know escape from Marvel this summer. Um, um, and be interesting to see what happens with the Disney Fox thing, but uh, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, I, I if hope it can it, deliver. A I hope it time, delivers. Now we know what yeah, to expect. yeah, yeah. I, I hope it's not a case of just lightning in a bottle one one time and and this is going to suck. I, hopefully, it'll. I mean, looking at the trailers, it's still you know got that vibe, that freshness, yeah. and I quite like the fact that in the trailer they say, "No, you stop it at two. You know, two's enough." Yeah, yeah, two. We're, <laughs> we're nailing the two. And, uh, that's quite something. Yeah. So great. actually, referencing sequels was, was quite a good idea. Yeah. And, uh, the, and, and it looks like they might have a good, good solid fill in. Josh Brolin, again, who was also playing Thanos. Yeah. <laughs> and, and there's actually, so the latest trailer I saw, there's actually some Thanos jokes in there. I don't know if yeah, you picked yeah, up on that. Yeah, there was a couple of Thanos jokes in yeah. there, which are really funny too. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that, that's looking good. So I'm going to go see that Thursday. So we'll talk about that next week anyway, because you're seeing it on the Tuesday. Mark, are you going to go and see it? No. Okay. <laughs> you believe the house? <laughs> Uh, the other Some f- of us don't spend all of our time in darkened rooms. <laughs> Going from a, a one room in your house to a darkened room in a cinema isn't yeah. quite the same. <laughs> uh, the, other, the other <laughs> film being released uh, is uh, Evan Rachel Wood, isn't it? Yeah, uh, Peggy Lesman, I think, so I might go and see it. <laughs> is, that, is that the whole reason? <laughs> she really? is gorgeous, isn't she? I mean, she's really gorgeous. Yes, she um, is very nice. Um, I think, uh, hasn't Kaz already seen Ka- it? Kaz has seen it. The review is going to go up. I'll, I'll, as as you've made the effort to listen to the podcast, people, he gave it a 7 out of 10. So just have to read the review, but he gave it a 7 out of 10. Has Kaz learned to type whilst he's watching or something? Basically. He, he seems... Knock out these reviews so quickly. <laughs> he sent me a, a Skype at two AM this morning saying um, that that review's finished. It's ready to publish if you're around. And of course, <laughs> I'm not going to be around at two AM in the morning. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was released on Sky Cinema at midnight, and he'd written the review by two AM. So there you go. That's dedication for you. We've got a really dedicated team here. I'm, I'm convinced now he doesn't actually sleep. <laughs> you may be right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he's given that a good review, so um, that might be worth. Picking up, uh, sorry, picking up. That might be worth going to see at the cinema uh, as well if Deadpool 2 doesn't take your fancy. But it's Deadpool 2 this week for me, I think. Um, disc releases, Steve. Yeah, we've got uh, a couple of, well, three actually, three big releases, all, all um, available as, I think, uh, a UHD disc as well, but definitely Blu ray. Greatest Showman, that's on Blu ray and UHD. Um, I have not seen it, but it's been wildly popular. Um, yeah. It's a musical about, well, I was going to say, it's about. P.T. Barnum, but I think it's <laughs> it's got absolutely nothing to do with the reality. Yeah, well, Kaz scored uh, it, it as a nine. Over so... an awful lot. Sorry, Kaz scored it as a nine. So you know. yeah, well, I've heard it looks and sounds stunning, um, and um, some of the songs sound quite good. I know I've, um, I think this is me was a big hit. Um, I quite like that song actually. Um, I can't I can't say it's my cup of tea just because it. I mean, it does just you know, it, 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 um, deviates from the truth so much but uh but yeah it's been very popular with lots of um i think it's been running in yeah, the but cinemas until... yeah but you kind of see that braveheart was historically accurate yeah, either. Know, it's I still know. a cracking film 
Yeah, no, but I mean, the whole point of this film is that it's claiming that you know it's all inclusive and you know we should be ourselves. P.T. Barnum was a bastard. You know, he treated people <laughs> like slaves. Um, so yeah, it kind of offends me. But yeah, it's been doing very well. It's been playing in cinema since Christmas uh, and getting lots of sing-along yeah. screenings. People yeah. going back to see it over and over again. So it's it's been a popular film, and I'm sure it looks and sounds fantastic on disc. Yeah. I, I just um, wanted so to you... um, clarify: Cast scored the movie is a seven, the disc is a nine. Yeah. Um, so that's out uh, this week. Also, we've got All the Money in the World, the Ridley Scott movie uh, about um, a kidnapping of J- John Paul Getty III's grandson, I think it is, um, in the 70s, and he refused to pay the ransom, even though he was the richest man in the world. Um, uh, and this is the film, obviously, that famously originally had uh, Kevin Spacey playing John Paul Getty, and then was then um, dropped unceremoniously and replaced very quickly by Christopher Plummer, who also got an Oscar nomination for his performance in the film. Yeah. So just to rub salt into the wounds. Um, so that's out uh, this week. And Kaz, think, Kaz has reviewed that as well, and he gave it an eight. Yeah, he's, he's a little dynamo, isn't he, Gaz? Gaz. <laughs> like I said, I don't know when he sleeps. Uh, and also out uh, this week is Molly's Game. Uh, has he reviewed that yet? Uh, let me just check the CMS. Uh, no, that's one he hasn't seen. Uh, well, he's seen it, I know he reviewed it at the cinema. <laughs> uh, and that's Aaron Sorkin's directorial debut. Also wrote it based on true story of a woman who ran, um, a woman called Molly, who who ran um, card games for high high. high I, th- I think we worked out that she was called Molly. <laughs> but I, I was just actually thinking that that's actually a plot point as well. Her real name, um, Molly Bloom. Um, I'm not sure if that is her real name because Molly Bloom is the lead, is the female character in um, in um, Ulysses. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's uh, it's written directed by Aaron Sorkin, and um, I think it got quite good reviews when it came out. Fantastic performance, central performance by Jessica Chastain. Uh, so if you're an Aaron Sorkin fan, definitely worth checking out. Good stuff. Um, you're going to be proud of me. I've been buying loads of UHD, Steve, and I've got loads of pre-orders coming as well. So a lot um, coming out this month. Expensive. Month. I, know, I know it has been expensive so far, but it's stuff like uh, I've already purchased Gladiator, so that turned up. Um, yeah, I've, I haven't watched it yet. I'm saving it for the weekend and the big screen. So um, welcome to the jungle. It turned up as well, Jumanji. We both saw that, um, and obviously that's uh, the UK release because you've had it for a while on disc, uh, US wise, but. That's a US, yeah, UK release which came out the same day as Gladiator, so they both turned up on release day. I've watched a little bit of that one there on the C8. Yeah, it looks, looks really nice. Um, and I'll get around to watching that on the big system because that soundtrack is just something else. Um, yeah. And what else have I got? I've got The Matrix on order, Saving mm. Private Ryan on order, oh, Ryan, yeah. Jurassic, Park, Park. Jurassic Park on order. Yeah. Um, Die Hard is seemingly coming out, but I can't find yeah, it anywhere. That's coming out of the states. It comes out, it's coming out of the states the next week. So right. you might have to buy. It. I don't know if it's got a UK release lined up it, yet. It has because we've had the PR through for that. Ah, so right. it is coming out in the UK. It's just I couldn't find it with any UK retailers to pre-order. So when um, sure, surely sh- they should have saved that for Christmas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they should have. Yeah, uh, but Kazi's review will be going up over the weekend. So. So by the time you listen to this podcast, we will have a review of that disc, and it's the UK version as well. So there you go. I just I can't find it at any retailers. Uh, Braveheart, I haven't ordered right. Braveheart yet, but I will be pre-ordering that. And like I say, Jurassic Park as well, one to three. Yeah, box set. Yeah. One to four? Uh, it's one to three in the UK. Is it? For the box set, yes. Yeah, so you got to buy uh, um, the uh, mm. Jurassic World separately. Or you, so, some sorry. some retailers are doing the steelbooks, so they're doing the four films as steelbooks. With right. that artwork, uh, for about seventy quid for the four, um, whereas the uh, the UK box set one to three, uh, I think it's forty quid. So it wasn't too bad actually. That's not too bad. That's not too bad. Yeah, pretty good actually. Uh, yeah, so that's everything I've got ordered. So I've got loads of stuff coming in, um, and uh, there's a, a lot of two for thirty offers at the minute. I've got my eyes on a few of them. So expensive. Have month. you have you even worked your way through? Your Blu-ray pile of to watch. Oh hell no! I've got stuff there that's been sitting for years to look at. <laughs> it's when you get two two formats behind. That's when you you, you <laughs> realise you've got a problem. You've got DVDs pile up you haven't watched yet. Yeah, well the thing is you you you've got stuff sitting in the pile on Blu-ray, and I'm thinking, do I buy the 4K version because the 4K version's available now, and I still haven't watched the Blu-ray, so I'd I'd just jump in at 4K. <laughs> I was actually thinking that this morning because I saw there's a, a trailer for The Predator which comes out in September. Um, um, Shane Black's new film and I thought I don't actually have Predator or Predator 2 on Blu-ray I thought shall I get them or shall I wait and see if they turn off an Ultra HD Blu-ray <laughs> which they are bound to turn off aren't they just before Predator comes out on yeah. uh, 
you just know that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I've spent a fortune, but I'm, I'm sure you've got some more UHD news for releases coming up. Uh, there's only one title announced recently, um, and that's The Quick and the Dead, Sam Raimi's film, Western, um, which had a fantastic cast with, with um, Sh- Sharon Stone, Gene Hackman, and uh, a young Leonardo DiCaprio, which I really like. That's a fun, it's a fun movie. Um, so I'd be quite tempted to get that, actually. What, what that's it. To, that's um, it to be quiet. Otherwise. Well, I say it's quiet. I mean, there's a ton of stuff coming out. There's just nothing new's been yeah, announced. Yeah, um, <laughs> another one I couldn't find anywhere. 2001, what happened to that? Oh, that's been um, pushed back to the... So originally, it was all about it coming out in May, but now it's getting a 70mm cinema re-release in May. Ah, right. And then the disc is going to come out in the autumn. Okay. But uh, yeah, that, that, that's that been fully restored, and the restoration was overseen by um, Christopher Nolan. Yeah, I'm desperate uh, to see and it. I think it'll look, it, it'll look amazing. It's going to look unbelievable. That might be one... Worth going to the cinema to see. Yeah, I think. yeah. If you can find yeah. it, well, I don't know where. There's only screenings in this country. I think there's only two screens Bradford? left now. Is there one in Bradford? Yeah, there's one at Bradford, the seventy mil, and I think there's one in London as well. And that's it. That is that is it for the UK. There's two projectors. Yeah, I would love to see that yeah. screen at seventy mil. As far as I'm aware, anyway, that's it. But so. this should be absolutely, but should be utterly referenced yeah. through and through. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm reading a book right now about the making of the film. And the level of detail that Kubrick went to is just unbelievable. And, but he was like that with everything. Yeah, I mean, I mean, talk, talk, talk about OCD. There. That guy was just every that, frame that, of yeah. 2001 is yeah. perfect. Yeah. <laughs> every frame. Um, so yeah, and, and it's, I think it's a great film too. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Also, so, I, I, oh, I did notice in 2001 it, was, it escaped me until so I thought, oh yeah, um, they have uh, basically iPads in the film The Astronauts. <laughs> Um, and in fact, actually, there was a court case about the iPad. Another company was making a tablet, and they were being sued by Apple. And they used 2001 uh, in their court case and said, "Look, th- th- it's not like it's a new idea. Yeah. <laughs> it's been around for years." So um, yeah, they were IBM iPad um, set tablets. But so so there you go. That was a bit they went, what they got wrong. <laughs> there you go. Well, I mean, um, Arthur C. Clarke was very very clever man when it came to the future. He got a lot of things right, didn't he? Yeah, and they also hired some um, some guys from NASA and stuff, you know, and guys from IBM and that sort of thing to sort of think thirty years ahead. And some of it they got they got pretty spot on. Obviously, a lot yeah. of it they got wrong. Like we haven't got space stations spinning around the, around the Earth, and no one's going to the moon, hasn't been to the moon again since seventy two. But um, yeah, I mean, a lot of it they they, they got certainly uh, the, the the idea of um, AI is really becoming uh, quite relevant now, isn't it? Yeah, with how. I think that's about it. I think we're feature length yet again, and there's only been three of us on the podcast, which is, you know, it, it happens sometimes, doesn't it? And um, I think TV season coming along, we've had lots to get through this month, so hopefully we haven't bored you too much. Um, hopefully there's been some interesting stuff in there. We'll be back, hopefully back to normal on next week's podcast. We'll have Edge report from the Munich show, so I'm sure there's been some absolutely fantastic hi-fi at absolutely ludicrous prices that Ed will be uh, gushing all over and with his man maths trying to work out if he can afford the stuff. It's so only 30000 which is actually quite a good price for that. <laughs> <laughs> If you sell one kidney to Chinese triads, that's all right. Yeah. It, you know, sometimes in the world that we're in and, and the, the stuff that we get to see, and certainly when when we did a lot of um, custom install coverage and that kind of thing, and you're turning up to some of these houses with some of the home cinemas in, and it's just, wow, just a different different universe, mm. different planet altogether. And you soon get lost in that and thinking, oh, I'd love to have that. Oh, no. One day I'll have this. and Yeah. Pipe dreams. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're spending it all on petrol. So. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I haven't been too bad. I've only put 3,000 miles on this car, which I'm astonished with because the last one had loads. But again, we're digressing. We really should be wrapping up. It's uh, it's feature length. Yeah, again. Uh, right, so that's it for this week. Like I say, we're back to normal next week with the, with the crew. And my thanks to Steve Withers. You would have made me a most agreeable wife. Thanks for doing the accents this week. And Mark I think Robert. I rough accent, my Indian accent do sound quite similar, though. <laughs> oh, sorry, I thought it was the same guy. <laughs> <laughs> and Mark Buttright. It's over. Go home. I'm already home. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook, bookmark AV forums, let's reviews, news, and videos. And of course, why not leave us a five star rating on iTunes? But only if you enjoyed the show. I'm Phil Hinton. Thank you very much for listening. And like I say, we'll see you again next week. Yeah.